thank you and uh, thanks to Bob and Jana for uh, being very welcoming and giving me a comfortable stay here in Wichita. And believe it or not, I've actually been to Wichita before. Uh, apparently that's pretty, uh, not very common. So um, over this next 45 minutes, I was going to give you an overview of my work and connect it to my personal experiences so you can see how it feeds into or influences the kind of work that I do. And I'm going to do it by also combining it with my own personal snapshots and photographs and, uh, and my work so that um, they kind of converge at the end. As my husband says, my work is all about me, me, me. So uh, the work connects to the experiences that I've gone through, but also I try to make it more um, universal so that anyone can hopefully connect with it and learn something from it. So for example, here I am as I think maybe the first Indian Virgin Mary in England. <coughs> I was born in England and spent uh, 10 years of my life there. Let's see, that's not working. Um, this is another snapshot of my family at Land's End in England. Uh, my parents, I, I grew up there and lived there till I was 10 years old. Uh, my parents took us back to India to grow up with Indian values. And you'll see that, um, ironically, that didn't work out too well. <laughs> so this is another snapshot from college. And um, uh, I spent nearly 20 years in India and ended up marrying someone who was divorced, Jewish, a different religion, uh, obviously a different culture and race, and also has um, a daughter, Adina, and that's her at our marriage. <clears throat> I've known her since she was two, and she's now 22, and consider, uh, considers herself part Indian. <clears throat> so my larger work deals with memory, and whether it's personal, historical, and now communal, it comes from the perspective of someone who's lived between cultures. So I photograph, I've been photographing in India for the last 18 years, where I photograph the memories of India, the gestures, the smells, the sounds that remind me of my home culture, and the love that I have for my home culture. And these photographs are done with a simple toy camera. It's a $20 camera called a Holger. And one of the reasons I use it is because um, it has a plastic lens and it vignettes the image to make it look more like a memory. Also, when I'm on the streets with this plastic camera, no one takes me seriously and no one bothers me to take a photograph. <laughs> but there's also another reason for using the Holger. Um, when I was in college, in India, you have to choose your major before you go to college and you can't change it. And when I was in... Um, my high school, I, the math teacher pulled me aside and said, you're going to fail. So I said, okay, I'm going to show you differently. And I got 96% by just studying in two weeks. So I thought, that's perfect for my college. I can just study for the last month before every exam and enjoy the rest of the time like this, sleeping in class. Um, but obviously that didn't happen. But because of my math background, I have, I think photography is both a combination of a science and an art. And I think uh, because of that background, I was able to pick up the more technical side of photography. And also, uh, and I didn't want to be bogged down by that technology. And so I liked the challenge of using this very simple camera to try and make beautiful images, similar to some of the craftspeople in India who you know, use very simple stitches to create incredible uh, tapestries. But when I was in college, I, took, I had, was lucky enough to have an elective, and I was in a photography class where um, the, my memories, there were 15 of us, two rolls of film, and one camera for the whole class. So we had to take, I think, three images, so you had to really think about the images you took. My mother, luckily, like any mother, kept that album, that, I, that book that I made of my photographs, and I thought maybe you'd like to see these masterpieces that showed all the potential that I had in terms of becoming a photographer. So this is one of them. It's a photogram uh, using a doily. And this is one of the other masterpieces. <clears throat> 
So I've been doing this work for about uh, 20 years. I've now lived in the United States longer than I've lived in India. So I felt as if I need to move on. So I've stopped actually doing the images. And just last year, Blue Sky Books uh, brought out a book on this uh, work with an essay by Vicki Goldberg, um, the former art critic from the New York Times. <clears throat> and she, uh, I'm just gonna read a quote that she wrote. As Matthew uses it, the camera, that expert embalmer and preserver of the past, that master key to modern memory, performs like memory itself. Even as it recreates, it transforms, and it hints suggestively, fragmentarily, that whatever you're seeing must still be there. <clears throat> and this is available through Blue Sky Books. So these images are printed very small. They're five by five inches. So you have to get really close to them and it's almost like looking into a keyhole into another country or uh, time. Um, so obviously I was, uh, I grew up in India during a formative time of my life as you know, a young Indian woman. And having lived in England and being influenced by maybe different gender roles that I experienced there, it was a little bit of a shock coming to India. And, um, and so, as much as I love my home country that I showed in the earlier work, I also was critical about some of my experiences that I experienced. And um, I decided to use, um, actually, just to go back a little bit, when I started photography, I thought I wanted to be a photojournalist and go back to India and fight for women's rights. But, I realized over time and trying that I don't have the personality to be a journalist. Uh, my husband is one, but I couldn't, uh, it's, it just wasn't me. So I had to find a way to speak about the issues that I was interested in, but in a way that uh, I was comfortable in, co comfortable with. So as some of you may know, Bollywood has the largest movie industry in the world, and the movies are very melodramatic and stereotypical. And so I decided to use the, that imagery to make my own statements. <clears throat> so this one is about the dowry system that still exists uh, even in my community, even though um, it's against the law in India. And it reads, it may have started as a good idea, but now it's a price tag. Um, in the Indian culture, it was considered, at least in my community, it was considered that once you get married, you, belong, you don't belong to your family anymore, you belong to the husband's family. And so the dowry, which consists of money, jewels, uh, land, variety of things, were a way of giving the daughter part of her, uh, proper, uh, part of her share of the property. But as a young woman, when I was growing up there, it felt more like a price tag. And I was also influenced by my father who um, over 40 years ago, um, who's mentioned over here, did not take a dowry. And so I, and even he went through an arranged marriage but did not take a dowry. And so I wanted to find someone who would marry me without the a price tag. So as I mentioned, I grew up in England, but I became conscious of my skin color only when I came to India. And this is something that an aunt told me, don't play in the sun, you'll get dark and no one will marry you. Uh, Fair and Lovely, which is um, the title of this piece, is actually a lotion in India that a lot of women use to try and get fairer and look more like the, these are Indian actresses who look almost Caucasian. And now there's a cream called, I think it's Fair and Handsome for men. <clears throat> so, um, having an arranged marriage where you meet someone once or twice, which was what my parents did and were very happy, I just couldn't come to terms with that. And so this is called Death Sentence, where it reads, I have to, I've, uh, I have to decide now whether I want to spend the rest of my life with him. And you can see I've started to bring in the self-portraits into the pieces. So this just shows you some of the manipulation that I do. On the right is the original, photo, uh, original poster, and you can see I've brought in actors from other posters into the one I've done, toned down the colors, changed things around a little bit, and uh, all these credits are actually um, poking fun at some of my ex-boyfriends. So. Um, so 
the work is shown in uh, museums and libraries, but I really wanted it to be seen by a South Asian audience. And so um, I have shown it in multiple uh, different venues. One was when I had a show at Smith College in Northampton. We had it on the buses that went between the five colleges so that it can be seen by a larger audience. Also, when I had a show at the De Cordova Museum, which is near Boston, we had the posters as advertisements before in, um, in, movies, in movie theaters that showed only Bollywood movies. So I had this captive South Asian audience who saw my posters before they actually saw the movie. And so I've tried to think of alternate ways to um, show the work in alternate spaces. And I did this work in what I call my uh, angry young woman days, uh, when I was really, you know, really angry about everything that I had gone through. But during my uh, Fulbright in, to India two years ago, I revisited it. One is because of um, the horrific Delhi rape that happened uh, when I was in India, and some of you may have heard of. And it was the first time I actually saw the middle class come out and protest on the streets. And I also joined them, but I also wanted to do something um, that, I, that I could contribute to in terms of this conversation. So I made some po three posters related to the Delhi rape. And I'm just going to read you a quote that a politician said. Chow mean leads to hormonal imbalance, invoking an urge to indulge in such acts. <clears throat> so a lot of these quotes were just uh, unbelievable in terms of what people said. So we put them up on the streets of Bangalore and Delhi so that people walking by would uh, see the posters and then usually quickly walk away, or sometimes uh, ponder them too. So now shifting my experience to living in the United States, um, I arrived in the US over 20 years ago, and I have a British, Indian, slightly American accent, and so when people ask me where I'm from, if I say Rhode Island, no one believes me, and if I, <laughs> And if I say I'm an Indian, I often am asked am I, if I'm a Native American or an Indian from India. And all this confusion started because Christopher Columbus was looking for India, but found North America instead. So what I do is I take 19th century photographs of Native Americans and pair them with self-portraits. And the text below uses humor, but also makes the viewer reassess their assumptions about people outside the majority. As Nancy Brokauer eloquently wrote in the photo review, the work touches on questions of history and travel, of how the present speaks to the past, the familiar to the foreign, the near to the far. So, um, um, one of the most well-known photographers of the Native Americans was Edward Curtis, and I base the presentation of this portfolio based on his uh, portfolio. But one of the things that he was also known for, um, despite being really important in terms of some of the recordings that he made of the different people that he photographed, is that sometimes he would make people wear clothes that were not particular to their tribe to make them look more exotic. And so I've taken clothes and things from India, but I've mixed and matched them. You'd never really see anyone wearing this um, um, in India, but I'm kind of commenting on some of the history of photography. And one of the other histories that I'm commenting on is the colonial photography in India and the history of categorizing. There was a book called Tribes of India um, where they tried to categorize the different uh, people of India based on uh, measurements and, yeah, based on measurements. So uh, a quote that influenced me in terms of using the self-portrait was by Susan Sontag where she wrote, there's something predatory in the act of taking a picture. To photograph people is to violate them by never seeing themselves. By having knowledge of them they can never have. It turns people into objects that can be symbolically possessed. So, um, so I felt that by using the self-portrait, uh, I'm turning the camera onto myself and representing me the way I want to be represented. And also I think that digital is changing this. Now, 
with, when you shoot with a digital camera, you can actually turn it around and show people how they are being represented, which I think um, does change that power d dynamic between the photographer and the subject. So some people say, oh, you know, this confusion between the Indians doesn't happen anymore. Well, in this recent doctor's uh, form, I'm now a declined Indian, and I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> so. so this is a set of two photographs. This is Tom Tolino on the top left, a Navajo on his entry to the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania, and the same person three years later after he'd been so-called civilized. So bottom right is me as a civilized university professor. So here I explore the uh, notion or the concept of assimilation into the dominant culture. And there was a history of civilizing of the natives in uh, British India too. <clears throat> So here you have a traditional American Indian and daughter, a mother, actually I've got the text wrong, traditional American mother, Indian mother and daughter, and a contemporary Indian American mother and stepdaughter. So here I play not only on the assumptions of someone who looks different, but a relationship that also contradicts expectations. So when I was doing, I had the idea of, you know, an Indian from India, but I didn't know how to visually communicate the idea. And as I was looking through a lot of archives and photographs, I came across this image, which uh, the curve of the armchair was similar to one I had at home. And that's how I got the idea to actually put this together. And um, if some of you are interested, I used the same background as the original photograph and just put myself on top of that, the photograph I take of myself. And they're all usually taken in my living room or kitchen using natural light. Um, one of the things I say when I teach is that when you use Photoshop, you should use it as a tool for communication rather than having the image look Photoshopped as a verb. So um, I just found this kind of strange uh, Native American wearing a flag and me wearing a flag as a sari. So my uh, stepdaughter actually would help me out with all my photo shoots. And she just graduated with a degree in costume design for period theater. And so I take some credit for her career choices. <laughs> so this was from a recent exhibition where someone wrote, uh, I'm an American Indian who was engaged to an East Indian who was living in the West Indies. Our kids would have been triple Indians. So I loved that. So one of the grants that I got, um, actually that was another one which I'm gonna mention, but anyway, uh, this is the virtual immigrant and it's about, um, when you call a 1-800 number, a lot of times you're talking to a call center worker who lives in India and who has to become an American for a work day. And um, this resonated with me because when I became a citizen, it, they give you a booklet, and in the booklet they say, oops, why is it not moving? Oh, here we go. They say you are no longer an Englishman, a Frenchman, an Italian, a Pole, neither are you a hyphenated American. And it was like, how can I give up, suddenly give up being Indian? I am, all those uh, cultures have, um, have affected who I am. Uh, whereas a call center worker can become an American for a work day, but go back to being Indian at the end of the work day. So I decided to explore some of their ideas of identity. So this is what a call center looks like. And um, <clears throat> um, before I actually show you the work, I'm gonna explain what the prints look like, which are called lenticular prints, which we actually have in the show by another artist. So it's um, a print where when you move from side to side, you may see two or three different images. And so you can see this uh, installation show. So what happened was when I was interviewing the, uh, the call center workers and then photographing them, they would always stand in the same position. So I started asking them to bring two sets of clothes. One was clothing that they would wear to go to work, to the call center. And then the other was work, um, 
clothes that they would wear for a formal Indian occasion, which is more Indian clothing. And then I made these lenticular prints where you have to go back and forth between the two, seeing them being both American and both Indian. And then I uh, put together the audio into a 10 minute piece that plays um, in the background. And I like the fact that you have to move back and forth between these two cultures. I like the metaphor of that for the work. So this work was these lenticular prints and just this next week, I've, um, I'm doing for the first time an installation, a public arts installation where uh, people will walk into the space and see the animation that I'm just about to show you and call a 1-800 number to actually hear the audio. So uh, let's see if this works. C.S. Sanjeev. Sirilata Ramnath. My name is Desikan, Desikan Devrajan. Hi, my name is Rehana Sitar. Actually, I chose initially Arnold Brown. My uh, idol is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. But uh, somehow that name didn't sound good for my colleagues, so I had to change it. Okay. Otherwise, I, cho I chose the uh, name of Arnold Brown because I, uh, I'm brown in color and Arnold is my idol. Cecilia Connor. <laughs> Doreen. Robert Spencer. Lisa James. Uh, Fahim used to be called uh, John in the company. So that is changing now. Fahim is Fahim in India and in America. In office, uh, Doreen is uh, very dedicated to work and uh, she's very jovial with all the f colleagues. Like she's entirely different. And when I go back to home, that's as a Kirti, I think that I'm one among my family members. The moment they, they finish with the call, you know, they put their, their headphones away. You know, it's, it's pure Kannada that he speaks. I don't know which part of the world I'm living in right now. When I get back home and when I speak with that same accent, uh, my wife, uh, she thinks uh, I'm uh, trying to act very smart. She'll sometimes say, come on, you're, you're at home, come on, behave yourselves. But my ch children will really like the way I speak in American accent because uh, they find it is very stylish and so they find even they try to imitate me and and they're trying to speak in American accent because they know that will be the future of India. It's more like uh, you are in some kind of a US country here, the way people work or the way they talk, the way they dress or <laughs> party. It's bringing people to the limit of what, what am I? Who am I? And am I an Indian more or am I an American? More? They say the behavior has changed the way of talking has changed. Uh, <laughs> the way of eating, everything has been changed. <laughs> My sisters tell me, we don't want a foreigner here, so you can go. <laughs> um, this was another quote by one of the call center workers. India has completely forgotten Gandhi. Right now we have Gandhi only on the currency, nowhere else. So in 2007, I received a McCall Johnson grant, which is actually from um, through the Rhode Island Foundation. It's given to three artists every three years. And what was nice about the, gr the grant was I didn't have to apply with an idea. It was based on my old work. So it allowed me to just experiment with a variety of ideas um, until I had settled on what I wanted to do. So, um, so I started experimenting with time-lapse photography and at the same time, I was in India, and I would go to my, you know, visit some of my mother's friends, and they know of my interest in photography, so they would pull out their photo albums and show me these old photographs, which, you know, I absolutely love. And so I started um, photographing the families uh, with their two or three generations of women, and then putting them into the same space, so that they become these photo animations. They're about one minute long. And this one has a, a special resonance for me because this is my sister-in-law and niece. So I started uh, this project in India, and I was really struck by the variety of photographs that I came across. 
going through these photo albums made me realize that uh, I've been actually using snapshot photography for a number of years. I didn't really make the connections until this recent show at the, at the ROM in uh, Toronto. About, I guess it was in 1997, I had um, the opportunity to go to England to spend some time, and I thought I'd do Memories of England the same way that I had done Memories of India. And when I came back, when I looked at the photographs, the only thing they reminded me of was my father, who at that time had died 20 years ago. So I decided to do something to commemorate that. And I started inserting images from snapshots from my childhood in these images that I had recently made. And then I would put them onto Polaroid and take them off the Polaroid and stretch them so that they're kind of distorted and fragile. So I've, I have had a long fascination with family photographs because they can both capture special times for, forever but also hide histories. So my father died from complications uh, with um, smoking, and so the book is the cover of the book is made from tobacco paper, and I present it in a Chesterfield box. And this is from the recent, it's very small, and this is from the recent installation at the ROM. So back to regenerations, um, I thought I'd walk you through the process a little bit. I've also done the work in Vietnam, and so with this Vietnam, Vietnamese family, so I go to these people's houses. You a lot of snow. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I love it. I oh. for you and him. And so that's what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I love it. I feel like you're doing the Oh, my God. Cheers. <laughs> and then I... Um, you know, get the people to uh, reenact the pose of the original photograph that I choose, and then using a lot of post-production Photoshop, I put the person back into the old photograph and then create the animation. And so there's a lot of post-production and a lot of versions of the file that keep going and going, and, you know, they get pretty ugly, by, the titles get pretty ugly by the end of it. So, as I mentioned, I've done the work in Vietnam and Israel, and it leads to a lot of adventures, too, which I love. Um, for this family, we had to hire a scooter and go to this island on this small ferry, get stuck in a procession that went by. And um, this is my husband, David, with uh, my lighting equipment. And this is uh, me eating a banh mi sandwich on the side of the road. And I was thinking about that today at lunchtime when I had another banh mi sandwich. <clears throat> and this is a behind the scenes, um, you can understand the shooting that we do. This hand, no, this hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I love how the new, the young generation knows to look at the back of the camera right away. So I present this work on framed iPads, so they look as if they're an original photograph, but then you notice this glow of the screen, and um, it's the animation that runs in a loop. So one question I get is, how do I find families? Uh, one is through personal networks, uh, through contacts. Facebook has been amazing in terms of connecting with me with families. And the other thing I do is, I, when I go to a place, I 
connect with a local photographer. So this was Abu Turk, a Palestinian photographer that I met, and um, he actually allowed me to photograph his family. Oh, really? <laughs> she said she wants she wants to sit in a chair and and uh -huh. yeah yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this was the photograph from the shoe. And this was the original family photograph, which uh, I thought was pretty unusual. <clears throat> so my trips to Vietnam and Israel made me conscious of, of how political events shape the way that different families gather, keep, and appreciate old family photographs. Um, and this piece in particular uh, changed the way I started looking at doing these animations. So when I learned that she was a Holocaust survivor, I realized that every family has a story. And um, by just seeing the animations, you really had no idea of a sense of who they are and some of the histories they had gone through, experiences they had gone through. And the other thing that happened was um, I went to the Holocaust Museum and um, some of the parallels with the stories about partition made me realize there's nothing to commemorate the partition in India. And the children of partition are now in their 80s, and the stories are going to be lost with them. So this led to my Fulbright to India and the work called Open Wound, Echoes of Partition. So a little background about the region, which is now India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. The British first arrived in 1510 and then slowly colonized the area till 1947. That's 437 years. The area was made up of kingdoms, not countries that are defined as they are today, similar to what happened in the Middle East after World War II. <clears throat> so during the partition, as many of you, you may have seen in the exhibition, uh, 15 million were displaced in three months. Over a million died, and there's nothing to commemorate the experience of those who went through this, uh, this tragedy. So this photograph is by Margaret Burke White, who photographed during the partition. I grew up in India, a country associated with Gandhi, nonviolence, and yoga. Yet the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947 was one of the most violent periods in the 20th century, only rivaled in scale by the 1994 Rwanda genocide. As Nisjiz Hajari wrote in his book, Midnight Furies, Nearly 70 years later, partition has become a byword for horror. British soldiers and journalists who had witnessed the Nazi death camps claimed partition's brutalities were worse. Infants were literally found roasted on spits. In my opinion, it is important to honor and collectively remember the people who were affected by the partition. It is also important to know our violent history in order not to repeat it. Historians such as Ramachandra Guha have written about the repeated incidents of violence in India, which have been echoes and reverberations from the initial trauma of partition. So I continue to use this photo animation technique um, and also include some of the stories of the children of partition. And I wanted these stories to become available to a larger public rather than being an academic oral history. Oops, it's not moving. There we go.
So again, this runs in a loop. Um, the book upstairs, the 1947 book, has five of the 10 animations I made. This is the, the book which is upstairs that has uh, five of the animations. So um, I did this work about two or three, I mean, I, it took a long time to do the post-production, but I just finished that last year. And one of my, one of the things that I really wanted to do was not just have the Indian uh, point of view, but also include the Pakistani and Bangladeshi uh, uh, points of view to make it not just one-sided. And so when I had the show at the Ram, the curator asked me, how can I help you make some new work? And I said, I'd really love to meet the Bangladeshi and Pakistani community. And so I've been slowly making contacts with them and have started uh, doing some, uh, photographing some of the families. I'll be doing another one next week. And in connection to that, about a month ago, I, as Bob was mentioning, I received this um, professorship from the University of Rhode Island, which allows me to uh, travel a little bit more and it's to expand the open wound to include the stories of both Pakistani and Bangladeshi families, um, especially in the, in the United States. So if any of you know families, I would love to be able to make contact with them. So moving to the last body of work, <clears throat> um, the seeds of this project started because of incidents that I had gone through, but also incidents that have happened in the recent past. The word immigrant conjures up images of families passing through Ellis Island or young men climbing across the southwestern border fence. Yet it's more than that. It's the core of America as an idea and a reality. We are a nation of immigrants with an economy built on the labor of immigrants, yet we fear and vilify them. Our love-hate relationship with immigrants reflects a duality. And reading this makes me realize a lot of the conversation that's actually going on right now in terms of some of the political debates. <clears throat> this is especially important as the America of yesterday, filled with immigrants of European descent, is giving way to a new multicolored and multicultural America by 2050, where one-time minorities will become the majority. That's my title. This is simultaneously a personal and a communal project, having experienced prejudice as an immigrant and watching the experiences of others. For example, um, this was a brown student who went missing, who was of South Asian descent, and when the Boston Marathon happened, it went viral on Reddit that he was uh, the, the bomber, when actually he was someone who suffered from uh, depression and had uh, was actually was had was dead died. It also um, relates to what happened on September twelfth, two thousand one, where I was listening to NPR in Providence, Rhode Island, and heard that this gentleman, a Sikh gentleman, had been arrested off the Amtrak train, um, and it's all because the passengers thought he looked suspicious. He was actually just uh, going back to Virginia after visiting his uh, wife, um, but he wore a turban, and so the, the, um, the passengers called the police. And this happened just um, uh, two months ago in Rhode Island where a local mosque had graffiti written over it, and obviously also the recent killings in North Chapel in February. So one of my questions is, how can we be part of this culture without being second-guessed? <clears throat> and this is a graph that shows you 200 years of uh, immigration in the United States and how the colors are changing since 1964. So these incidents and my own experiences made me interested in letting others know the stories of how and why many of us come to this country to hopefully create empathy and understanding of those who don't look typically American. So this is a Vietnamese uh, family that I photographed. Not sure if you can read the text, but it says, we flew to Manila and spent a night at a US military base. 
then a week at a refugee camp in Guam. And a month at Camp Pendleton, tent number 88. Other than $20 and a few clothes, all we had were these photographs, which is a legacy that my father gave to us, left us. They are, ir they are irreplaceable. So this is a picture actually of the family in the camp in Pendleton. Oh. My mom had 15, 11 wow. girls and four boys. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And mm. the, the own family together now, 128 person. Okay. okay. Together. Yeah. And all of you managed. So I go into the houses and as soon as you open up that photo album, they tell you all these stories and memories flow out and I'm able to really connect with the families. And while I'm doing that, my husband usually assists me and puts up the lighting in the living room and gets the children to also participate. And then I take photographs of okay, the so families for them. Around, you know, should I, or? No, no, just, okay. Yeah. And after I do that, then I get the women to reenact the scenes. Hotel. And sometimes I get but, really good wow. food. All right, so hold your spoon up, and this is the end of the video saying, I do this actually just because I get to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so new opportunity like a bright star draws immigrants across the world. Sometimes they have found success and happiness, but the, the other side of displacement, its black sun, is loss. So this is a... Um, Iranian German uh, woman. This is the only photo photograph I have of myself as a child. Wearing Lederhosen in Iran. I have no home. My first home I had to leave violently. And it was my people sending me out. Where should I go? I don't know, this is my home. No, it is not. So the project has just started and social media has been great for dialogue as well as finding families. It's also been, uh, families also contact me through recent articles that uh, have come out. And I'm also looking for more of a spectrum of socioeconomic and ethnic uh, populations to kind of fill out the whole project. And so one of the things I do is I give out brochures in different languages that describe the whole project. Okay, this is a short video that shows, I, so I do a lot of community events where we set up a photo booth and take pictures of the community and after they see me two or three times, they start to connect with me and that's how I find my families. So this was at a local library. It was a Latino uh, reading event. And so I get my students to also be involved and we make them prints on the spot so that they get something from it. It'll work. So this is uh, one of the images that were from this photo shoot. Um, I have to sometimes photograph in unusual situations where it's outdoors, but we just kind of, um, you know, 
improvise. And R David really helps me in terms of, uh, when I'm interacting with other people, I often forget all the stuff that I teach in my classes. So he kind of calms me down, but also um, you know, helps figure out and problem solve a lot. Um, this was the original photo of a Filipino family. And if you can see over here, she has a dress on. So um, when I reenact the scene, they're not, obviously not going to wear that kind of dress. So I had to reenact, uh, re basically create a chair. When we first arrived, my mother and I didn't fight about grades. Only about folding clothes and vacuuming. My mother told me not to worry about money. She said, we will call, call Oprah if necessary. <laughs> so in terms of this family, it was actually the granddaughter who I was in touch with on email. I didn't know it was a granddaughter. But she's, she grilled me more than any other family has, which I think was really good. So you can see that my work deals with memory, whether it's personal, historical, and now communal. So I wanted to end on a quote, which is by Oscar Wilde, which says, memory is a diary that we all carry about with us. So thank you. And if you want to see more work, you can go to my website, anumatthew.com. Thank you.